I had begun this uh, theme earlier, but we have many more people here. And I ask the uh, permission of those who have heard the beginning of this to please be a little, um, a little patient and allow me to review some of the stuff. Huh? <laughs> you see how now say I am? I was thinking it and I did say that. Um, and I think that you weren't even here for that, uh, Roseanne. So, okay. The story of Yosef and his brothers is one of the m m best, one, n best known stories, not only within the Jewish world, but in the world generally. There are enough movies, plays, right? It was wonderful. His uh, technicolor uh, coat. Uh, everybody knows the story of Yosef. And if I were to begin, and I'm going to, by telling you the story of Yosef, as we all learned it uh, while we were coloring in the coloring books in the, um, the second grade. I was still doing that in the 13th grade. Anyway, um, I would tell you what we've all known about the story of Yosef. And I'll begin with that. And well known to you. Now, those of you who have heard me give some of this before, Please don't interrupt because I know you're smarter than uh, what I'm going to say, so you be very patient. Please. We know the story of Yosef as a story of a young man. Know how old Yosef was when we were first introduced to him in Parshat Vayeshev. Ben Shvaya He was 17 years old. While I mention that, I'm going to throw in something else for two reasons. One, because if I wait for a little later, I'll forget what I was going to say. But secondly, because it will be important for us to know a little later on. I always ask the question because it's one that's not usually known. When you think about the story of Yosef and his brothers and his older brothers, how much of a gap is there between the eldest brother, Reuven, and Yosef, how many years of difference is there? Uh, I would think you would be surprised if I tell you there were six years, and that's all. Six years. Unless there is some miraculous uh, birth giving uh, within the years that you can get a child every uh, four months or five months. That's what it is. Because Reuven, okay, we are told, the Torah says very clearly, Reuven is born and it goes through all the other children, whether from Leah or uh, from uh, Bilhah or from Zilpah. There are 11 children, actually 12 from Dina, that are born, right? After that, we learn that Rachel finally has a child. Now, what, what, what would these years happen? They happen, Yosef is born um, before they leave the, uh, the, the uh, home of, um, of Lavan. Um, now, he's at, not only before they leave the, uh, the home of Lavan, but actually... Um, by the end of the 14th year that he was there. Seven years he's, he works for Rachel, and Lama says, nah, 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 we're going to give you uh, Leah. Good. So that's seven years. Says, but you can marry um, Rachel if you promise to work for another seven years. You can m marry her in a week, which is what happens. By the way, there's only a week between um, the marriage of, ya of uh, Yaakov to Leah and the marriage of Yaakov to Rachel. You can nice uh, shave a bracha, so it was very nice in the end. So now, in year seven, he, they, now he now has two, he now 
is married to both, and he has children with Leah. He has all the children of Leah. Then Leah, and don't ask me why, because I can't figure this out either. Leah realizes, oh my God, I haven't had children. I don't know how much time I've gone back. A week, two, I don't know, because she had four children, right? And then, and so she has, she calls upon um, uh, Zilpah, and they have two children. Then uh, Rachel having no children, takes Bila, two more children. And then Yosef is born, and that is still within the seven years. So my assuming is that it takes at least, I mean, I'd say nine months, a little, a little less, for Reuven to be born after he's married, right? So how many years is there between that seventh year and six and a half years? That was it. That's all. So get to clarify now everything. That's very important because when we get to speak about the brothers coming to Egypt and saying, oh, who is that guy with the beard? And so Chazal said, well, you can recognize him. He had a beard. There was only six years between Reuven and Yosef. I did not recognize him. And if that's Reuven and Yosef, how about the youngest of the uh, children who were born? They were a year or two older, and they couldn't recognize him, so we have to go into that. But this is part of the problems we're going to have when we take away the uh, coverings and the approach of Chazal, and Chazal have a very important approach, Chas Shalom. I'm not going to say they're wrong, they had a very important real, how they relate this story to what the text it says. That's why I call these classes trailblazing through the text of Tanakh. So the, the story that we know is uh, Yosef, good-looking guy, not too clever, uh, given the fact that he is uh, very, very proud of himself, twould seem, because his father gave him this great-looking coat. You know? And because of that, because he, he was given a ketonet pasim, which we all know means a multicolored uh, striped coat, which, of course, does not mean that, but at any rate, um, uh, pasim never meant anywhere in Tanakh stripes or colors. The one shot that I heard makes sense is the uh, explanation of Rav, uh, uh, Yoel ben Nun's father, actually. A pa, we have, in pas in Hebrew and in the Tanakh, pas yadav means the, uh, the pas, like the kaf yadav, the bottom. Ketona pasim was a cloak or a coat that was used, but it went all the way down to the uh, long sleeves. Long sleeves and a long robe type of thing, a cloak, we call it. Why is that important? Because those who work in the fields, whether they are shepherds or whether they are uh, in agriculture, they use short sleeves because it was easier to you know, get a boo-boo and take care of that than to have it redo your whole clothing gets ripped. But the overseers who don't work, they just say, you know, over there, give me a cup of coffee, go over there. You know, they don't work in the field. They wear, they are more of a, I guess, a royal type of thing, and they have long garments. The fact that Yosef had this tone at Pasim was indicative of the fact that his father saw him as the one in charge of the others who were working in the fields or in shepherding, which makes sense because that's exactly what the Torah says. It says that in the very beginning of introducing the whole story, it says that Yosef was in the fields, um, at Bnei Bilhab, at Bnei Zilpah, he was uh, who, uh, uh, with uh, uh, that he was with his brothers. He was overlooking his, uh, um, his brothers. He was in charge of them. And that's why Vayavei Yosef and Dibatam Ra'a Elavihem. 
That's why he would tattletale to daddy because he was in charge of that. He had to tell them what was happening and what was good. That was his position. He was given over. And though there may have only been six year difference, but let's face it, your bratty 17 year old kid is telling this 23 year old man what he should do and should not do. No. How to make friends and influence people. And that wasn't very good. It wasn't a good thing. There's your first problem. That we all know. And of course, to get so the, this cloak, how he's treated, and of course, the piece of resistance, <laughs> um, the fact that he now has dreams of grandeur. Right? He has his dreams. Doesn't, it's not a recipe for a lovely, lovely uh, family get-together, let's put it that way. This is what happens, okay? So as we know, um, there is um, uh, the father who is, anyway, Yosef is in charge after all, says, uh, I, I know that your brothers are tending the sheep up in um, Shem, why don't you go there and see how they're doing, right? And he sends them from, where is he? He's now in Hebron. That's where they are. And he goes, go over to and check out the, your brothers up in um, Shem. So uh, uh, Yosef says, fine, I will. Yosef goes there, can't find his brothers in Shem, and he hears somebody's walking in the, you know, he bumps into somebody in the, up, up in Shechem area, and he said, oh, I heard that your brother saying they were going to Dotan. And that's where he went. So he went to Dotan. And when the brothers see him coming from afar, they said, oh, here comes that dreamer. Let's go and kill him. And then we'll see how, how, uh, whether his dreams come true. When you're dead, that usually doesn't happen. And that's what they decide they're going to do. But before they do that, um, Ruven says, no, 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 no. You, you can't go and slaughter the boy. You know, after all. So you know what? Let's just throw him into a pit where he can't get out. Yeah, he won't. We won't kill him. He won't live, but we won't kill him. At least it will be a... Um, non-direct murder that we had, we can claim we had no no hands in it. We didn't. And the Torah tells us Reuven, the oldest one, who should have been the most resentful against Yosef, was also the most responsible. And the Torah says that Reuven just gave them that idea so that later on, before anything happens, he'll run over and save Yosef. That's, we are sending up, the, the, there it is. And that's what happens, and they grab, they see him afar when he comes closer to them, instead of saying, hey, Joe, how you doing? They take him, and they rip off his cloak, especially when they dis despised, and they threw him into a pit. And the pit was not only without water, as the Torah says, a deep pit was one that you really couldn't get out of. What is the thought of them? So what, he'll throw in the pit? What, what if he's going to die? Yeah, he'll die of thirst, hunger, or he'll die by being a, attacked by an animal. There are animals in that area. But we don't have, we didn't do anything about it. That was the plan. Okay? And then comes, to me, the most painful part of the story and the Torah tells us, They threw him in the pit, and then they had some pizza. They sat down for lunch. There's Yosef screaming and yelling, Help, help, get me out of here. I'm sorry, I didn't mean it. Come on, throw me a rope, something. And they're saying, yeah, whatever. And they're eating. While they're eating, well, they see the Orachat uh, Elim, they got a caravan of Ishmaelites, and uh, as I'll explain, uh, but I'll say even now, 
The Ishmaelites were uh, international traders, and they were therefore using the international route, the Via Mare, which is the route right by the sea, which is easy way to go down to where? Egypt, because that's the, 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 the two great empires in the north, of Babel, Babel, whatever is there. Sometimes it's Assyria, sometimes it's Babylonia, sometimes it's uh, Persia. And from there, and you go down to Egypt, which is a great land. That's where they did the trading. So they went to him, and as they, see, as they see from afar, there they are in Dotan, which is a hill in the mountainous area, and he sees, oh, look, down there. Great idea, says Yehuda. I'm feeling guilty about putting him to death. You know, never, poor guys. Let's sell him to the Ishmaelim, the Yad al and we won't be involved directly with his murder. Great idea, they all said, fine. So, as the Torah says, it seems, um, uh, traders come by, uh, Yosef is sold and brought down to Egypt. Okay? And that's, the, uh, uh, at this point, that's the story that we know. Now, I'd like to show you now that that really isn't fully true. Because we really have a big problem with the story of as given and as the Chazal hope us to understand. One, we have to figure out why in the world must Yaakov send Yosef to check out the brothers? If he was regularly there when they were shepherding, as it says he was, but what was he now? Why is he not there? Number two, the answer to that would seem to be, he says, I hear your brothers are shepherding in Shechem. Okay. You have any idea how long a, 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 you know, a little, it isn't like a little, let's have a lovely, lovely walk and go from Hebron to Shechem. Now, even by the buses that don't run that well. How long is it going to take? It takes two and a half, three, four days to get there. It's, it's a long way. Now, why is that troubling to me? You will know that. Very simple. Well, I'll put that aside. It's a problem. Why, he's, why does he send him? Why must he send him? Why? I, why, why? What are they doing up in Shechem? Right, you know, there's no grass next to Hebron. They're, 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 why? There's a problems in understanding the entire um, the entire story. Now, we are told, and you have this in source number uh, two, okay? And it's actually to number one also, but I didn't translate number one because there's too much to translate, but basically it's saying what, what it says, Rashi says also. When we are told the beginning of the story, and Yaakov sent his son Yosef from the valley of Hebron, and may, um, amazingly, Rashi, who was never in Israel ever, knew, and he's correct, his, his knowledge of the geography is was based upon Tanakh. It's, it's unbelievable how he understood, knew all of the stuff. But he did say a simple thing. Hebron's up in the mountains. Hebron isn't mountains. And, and, and what did it say? Amek Hebron. It isn't Amek Hebron. Hebron is in a hilly area. So he says, and you see the English, here it means from the deep council. Amek means amok, deep. The deep counsel of the righteous one, who was Abraham, who is, after all, buried in the Hebron, who was buried in the Hebron. And that's why this whole story goes on, as illogical as it seems. Why? It's fulfillment of that which was told to Abraham, to fulfill the promise God made to Abraham, which is that you're going to have your descendants who will be foreigners in another land. In other words, if I were to say it very simply, 
uh, and Tehillim says it, and we say it all the time, Rabot Machashavot Belev Ish, V'yatzat Hashem, Hitamod. Or, as we say in the purest of Yiddish, but I can't speak, right? Man tracht, Gott lacht. Mensch tracht. We are planning, we're going to do all these things, you know, and God, I say this all the time to you, you know, God's chuckling up there. Yeah, okay. Okay, so you're going to uh, take over Palestine, huh? huh? So you're going to get this out? Yeah, okay, whatever you think. God has his vision. And God has his plans. So he's laughing up there. God had a plan. And men had plans. It just so happens that uh, God sees to it that man's plans fill in exactly what he wants. That does not take away the responsibility. Do I then say, well, what are you blaming the brothers for? God made them do it. They're innocent. God wanted that plan. You don't do that. That's an old joke from the uh, former comedian Flip Wilson to say, you know, the, de the, de the devil made me do it. Stuyot. Man has responsibility. You have to do things, and you're, you will be held uh, responsible for your, uh, for your actions. Anyway, so um, all of this is just that. And that's an important thing to see when you see that. Um, and it goes on. Fine. We, we see that clearly uh, that they have, um, as I told you before, nothing else changes from what the story that you've, uh, that you've learned, except for the problems I have that we have yet to resolve uh, as far as, you know, why are they going there, what are they doing like that, so on and so forth, okay? Um, at any rate, the, um, if the story as it seems to be of the whole saga is in order to God to get them down to Egypt, you know, um, and it does not, absolve them of any guilt, I want to go one step before that. And that is, were they really guilty? Now, look, plotting to kill your brother is not the reason I would give you a shlishi on Yom Kippur. I, I admit, this isn't the nicest thing to do. But the question is, were they guilty of the murder of Yosef? who, as we all know, was not murdered, okay? So were they guilty of the sale of Yosef? That, that ain't too good either, you know? Kidnapping isn't the, most, the, the best thing for a good Jew to do, for anybody to do. So I want to show you that the text disagrees with what we've always believed. And there you see, in the um, I'll take you in the um, fourth source, okay? Now, I told you the story of how the Ishmaelim, the international traders, were going on with the international route down to, to Egypt. And then something happens. We've assumed, or we've been taught, that, that, the, that the, uh, they saw the Ishmaelim, the, that the, the, the brothers of Yosef saw the Ishmaelim, and they now sold Yosef to the Ishmaelim, which is a logical story. Unfortunately, that's not what the Torah says. Now, I want you to look carefully at source number four. There, um, it, I'm sorry, is it four I have it here? Maybe it's, it's a second part of three. I'm not sure how you have it there. The second part of three, Vayavru anashim midyanim socharim, 
there in English. What's happening now? We'll go through the whole thing. There you have, um, you know, Yosef's brothers having a pizza party. Yosef screaming from the pit. Oh, look, they're the Ishmaelim and they're traitors. What happens? That's all that. Oh, says yeah. Let's sell you. That says let's not kill. Let's, we'll sell them to the Ishmaelim. Now, at this point, is where the Torah seems to disagree with what we've learned in our coloring books. There it says the following. In English, then Midianite merchants passed by. Midianite merchants, not Ishmaelim. Now, let me explain something to you. There were two types of traders in that time, traders with a D, not a T, who did trading in the area. There was the international traders, the wealthy one, you know, Yishmaelim, the Arabs did that very nicely. But the local traders who went around, you know, they had, you know, they had maybe a makolet, you know, the smaller things. Yeah. They were traders in the area, whatever they can get in that area, as opposed to going from one empire to another that had rare things. The Midianites were local traders. Now, imagine to yourself what happened. There was the brothers of looking at the Ishmaelin chewing on their pizza, and behind them, unbeknownst to them, because they're far away, is they hear his cries, but you know they don't see what's happening over there. The local traders pass by. They hear the cries of somebody stuck in a pit. So what does it just say? Vayim shechu vayalu at Yosef bin Habor, and they drew Joseph out of the pit. Who's they? The Midianites. Now, we know about pronouns. And the last thing, it's a Midianite merchants, and they drew Joseph out of the pit. So who took Joseph out of the pit? Was it the Ishmaelim? Was it the brothers? Who were not even in the pit? No, it was the Midianites who took Yosef out of the pit. And they showed, sold Yosef to the Ishmaelites. And who was they who sold them to the Ishmaelites? Not the people who took him out of the pit? Of course. The Midianites sold him to the Ishmaelites. Ishmaelites were on the international thing. The, the Midianites were local. They took him out of the pit. What are they going to do with him? Hey, I'm going to sell him. Who was he? He's a nobody. I'm going to, we're going to sell him and make it some money. They also know that the Ishmaelites are down there. So they take him and they go and meet up with the Ishmaelites. And they sell Yosef. Now that's clearly true. Because Vayashav Reuven el Habor. Reuven just heard his brothers say, Oh, look, they're the Ishmaelites. Let us sell Yosef to the Ishmaelites rather than have him die in the pit. So they finished chewing, they had a bench, you know, they had, they had a bench, uh, they had just even cut you know, a la or whatever they were going to eat after their pizza, and they were going to go and they were going to sell Yosef, take him out of the pit and bring them down to the Ishmaelites who were getting closer as they go down. What was Reuven's plan from the very beginning? To save him. So when he hears that they're going to play, so he starts to go, and gets out of the way, you know, and he runs to the pit to grab Yosef and save him. That's what he does. And guess what? He ain't there. Yosef isn't there. He is going to save Yosef. And oh my God, Yosef is not here. I'm the eldest. What am I going to tell Papa? And that's what he says over there. He says, and therefore he tore his garments. What did he think happened? So what did he think when Yosef was gone? Did he say, oh, the Midianites probably came back and took him out. 
Did he see Midianites? No. So what did he think happened to Yosef? He died. He's not there. Ah. It was not uncommon. There were wild animals there. You had tigers, lions, and tigers, and bears. Oh, my. And they were, uh, you know, and go down into a pit, and they, they, had, they had lunch. Well, they had lunch. And the assumption is they dragged him out of the pit, and they went that put to their whatever den lair, and they, they ate him. It was a totally logical assumption. So he comes running back to, back to the brothers who were ready anyway to pull him out of the pit. And maybe, maybe Reuben says, uh, oh, I'll take him and I'll sell him, whatever. But he comes back and says, oh, my God. Yosef and Nenu. Yosef is not anywhere. Where is he? Well, what, what am I going to do? Now, let me ask you a simple question. If, as Chazal say, it was the brothers who sold Yosef, question one, which Chazal asked, well, where was Reuven? He had to be there. He said, I'm going to take him out of the pit. So what do they say? Who knows what they say? What the rabbis say, where was Reuven? Went to be with his father. Went to be with Papa. Correct. Now, I just told you, it's at least a three and a half, four day journey to go back and forth, to go back, just back, and then one goes back and forth. So we even have this brilliant thing I know what I'll do. You know, Tuesday I have to go down to Papa, so I'll be, I'll be back in a week and a half, and then I'll save Yosef. Does that make sense? No. no. Would you even think that way? Maybe, of course not. And if he was by, by Papa, what was he doing there uh, going to the pit? But more than that, when he comes back and tells his brothers, where is Yosef? Nobody said, hey, Ruby, what are you worrying about? We sold him. Nobody said anything. They didn't tell him. They didn't tell him. Why? Because they didn't know either. How could they not know? They weren't there. How did they know the Midianites took him out and sold him? It says here that, that, that what? Who sold him? Does it say the brothers sold him? I just told you. It was the Midianites. Well, the Midianites found him, pulled him out, and sold him. And then when they went back to take him out, because they should sell him, he wasn't there. But maybe the Ishmaelites sold him and pulled him out. That's exactly what they did. That's what I'm saying. The Midianites sold him out, but the brothers didn't know about it. They were eating. They didn't know any Midianites were there. How did they know? They saw the Ishmaelites. They saw the Ishmaelites, but it was the Midianites that took them out of the... Uh, the, the that's what it says. Well, it doesn't matter. From the brother's point of view, they didn't know about the Midianites. That's right. So, so, what, so how, come the, how come the brother who they were going to take out and sell, how come he wasn't there anymore? Because they were eating in church, and the Ishmaelites, they, could have, they thought the Ishmaelites were going to take them out. How would the Israelites come if they're coming from the international thing and, and the, not the local area? If the Midianites had come close already, they would have been there to give them Yosef. To give, to give them Yosef. They wanted to sell him to the, Midian, to the Israelites. But, 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 but they said, we're going to sell him to the Israelites. So you think the Israelites came and they didn't know about it? And they, they were following the Israelites going. And they said, when they get closer, we'll be able to sell him. But they didn't sell him because he was taken out. They didn't know where he was. But, they, but the, the, the uh, Israelites passed them close enough that if Yosef had been there, they might have seen him. Number one, that's your assumption. How do you know they were so close? If they are in the international uh, route, which is down by the sea, and they were up in the hills, the ones who took Yosef were the Midianites. They took him down. Yes, they took him down to the Ishmaelites. They're still up here. The Midianites took Yosef down to the Ishmaelites. The brothers are still up here waiting for the Ishmaelites to come closer so they could sell him. 
when they started getting closer, they went to, they were thinking, okay, you know, by 15 minutes, we'll be able to take him out of the pit. Reuben says, I've got to take him out before then and find out that he's not there. And they have no idea. If they had an idea, would they not have told Reuven, what are you crying about? We sold him, or we had him sold. He's okay. They don't say anything, not from that time till the end. They never make any statement that we, ki- that we sold him. Never. Never. No, the first one to figure. The f- that's why I'm saying the approach of Chazal is problematic. Because why would Reuven have a plan of saving Yosef and instead of doing so, left him in a pit and go down to see the father? That's why the whole, the whole approach is very difficult. And the fact that they didn't know, they didn't say anything to, um, you know, to Reuven indicates that they don't know what happened either. And the assumption was, and it was a very natural assumption, that he had been torn up, he had been eaten and killed. You know what their father says when he finds out? Tarov, Taraf Yosef. Yosef has been taken by an animal and was killed. That's the, the assumption. They never tell that to Yaakov. Yaakov says when he sees it, it must be that he was taken by an animal. But they knew going back to Ah, now we get to that point. You're right. So now they're stuck. We didn't do anything him. We threw him into a pit, which wasn't the best thing, but we, we didn't sell him. We didn't kill him. We don't know where he is. He must have been killed. But we are guilty. <laughs> What are we going to tell Papa? Don't worry, we didn't want to kill him. We just throw him in and an animal killed him. Okay, Dad, let's go. They couldn't tell him that. But more than that, how are they ever going to, you know, psychologists say it now also, Chazal knew it way before. One cannot be comforted by a loss unless he knows it's a loss. Look at the hell that we have here of the parents with the, the children in, 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 in the zoo over there in Gaza. It's hell. And as terrible as it was when people came, the children came, came back, what did they say? We have closure. Once you have closure, you can then go and have Avelut and try and redo. But as long as one is still there and you don't know, there's no closure. It's like Chazal say part of the halacha in, is that it's important, as painful as it is, for a person to be at the kavura and see the kavura. Because it's only after you see there's a real kavura can you accept the ultimate truth, as painful as it is, and start to rebuild your life. But without that, you can't. So how are we going to have our father Yaakov understand that Yosef is gone? Wait, we don't have a, 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 a body to prove it. How can we tell him that he's gone and convince him that he was so that he can start and he can go into Avelos and he can you know, rebuild his life after the loss of his beloved son? What do they do? They take the coat. Of course, they had it before. Now, they can't come and say, we happened to find this. So what do you do? This is another part that um, we often don't see. Look at the next thing there in 31. So they took Joseph's coat. They killed a goat. Nothing against the goat, personally, but they, they needed it, you know. Uh, and dip the coat in the blood. Why are you doing that? Ah. They then sent 
the coat of many colors, I don't think it means that, but I follow them, you know, to their father. Did they bring the coat to their father? No. no. They sent others to do so. Why? They were ashamed. Well, how can I go, go? Oh, I'm crying, I'm crying, but how did you find the coat? How come you got the coat? They didn't want to be judged. They didn't want to make themselves guilty, even though they were. So they sent it through somebody else. Two people come and they said, you know, and that's why if you see, it's so clear in the words of the text. Because it says very simple, very, very clearly, it says here, um, we have found this. Do you recognize if it's your son's coat or not? A, would they say, oh, is this Yosef's coat? Or we, we don't recognize it. Of course they recognize it. They knew very well what it was. It was very unique. And secondly, why would they say your son's coat and not say, isn't this Yosef's coat? It was your son because it wasn't they. It was um, people who were, had come and brought the coat to Yaakov. And that's what was going on here. And as a result, Jacob now assumes that he's dead and he tears his garments, goes into um, and weeps. For him, you know, Chazal say because the Torah says after that it says ki ereid el of the avail sheola. I'm gonna die still mourning for my son. Chazal say he still had a feeling that maybe he wasn't dead, and you can't really mourn if you don't think he's dead. Like I told you, Chazal knew this brilliance beforehand. So this is what happened. Did the brothers sell him? No. Did the brothers kill him? No. Did the brothers even know about it? No. So now we have a different scenario. What about intent? I, I didn't say do they intend to. No, they intended to. I asked, I asked the right question. Right? I didn't ask that question. We know what the intention was. I'm asking, do you, but did they kill him? No. Did they sell him? No. So what are they thinking? that he is dead. What is the father thinking? He is dead. So now you begin to understand. Why didn't they recognize Yosef in Egypt? Because Yosef was dead. They would never have even this wildest idea that Yosef is still hanging around, let alone the fact that he has a beard, yeah, I know. And he was also wearing Egyptian royal clothing. Yeah, that's true. But they wouldn't recognize him given the way he was dressed and because they know he's dead. Now you understand why it says, that they never recognized him. Because for as far as they were concerned, for the last um, 13 years, he was dead. Remember, he was taken when he was 17. They come before him when he is 31, 32. That's why. Now you begin to understand. Now, we'll go on board. Say, will I have time here? Oh, okay. Rabbis talk so much. Um, there are famous, very questions that we often ask. Two questions that are opposite. Yosef, you're now the viceroy. A nice, no, special photograph. Postcard, you can't send to your father. You can't go and send many of your people. I mean, you are your viceroy. You can go and send somebody to and tell your father, Papa, I'm okay. The great question. Everybody feels terrible. Well, you Yosef at Sadiq, you're a great Sadiq. Why don't you tell your father you're okay? Thinks you're dead. Answer is clear. 
Because Yosef was wondering, wondering, why didn't Papa send somebody to help me? Why is, where is he? He doesn't have enough money. He doesn't have somebody to come and get me. Because you know what? What does Yosef think why he was sold? You betcha. Not daddy, but that's secondly, but you're right. The Midianites may have taken him ahead of the Midianites who was there. So what does he think? My brothers threw me into the pit. They probably told the Midianites to take me out and to sell them. So according to Yosef, it's so logical. He assumes that the brothers did sell him. I, they didn't. He doesn't know that. He didn't read the Torah. But that's what he thinks. And why not? And why not? Why shouldn't he think it? Oh, how could he say that after all? Well, his father, yeah, dad was part of it. Why did he send me to Hebron from Hebron all the way to Shechem? He knows that my brothers hate me. He says that. And Yaakov starts yelling at Yosef and, and says, Stop with those dreams. He knew very well the feeling. There was a little friction in that family. And yet he sends Yosef by himself to go to the brothers who hate him and he's thrown into the pit. So Papa is part of the thing. So he's not going to help me. And before you raise your hand and ask, how could he think I, Yaakov loved him so much. How could he even imagine that he a favorite son? And I will respond. Remember Terach? You know who Terach was? He was Avram's father. Did Terach have only one son? Three. One died and Nachor didn't. And the only one who was chosen to go on with that family was Avram. Did Avram have one son? No, there are two. But only one of them was chosen. Does Yitzchak have one son? There are two. And only one of them was chosen. Now Yaakov has, great, 12 kids. And what does Yosef think? I guess I'm the one who's not going to be included. And if that's the case, I'll make it big in Egypt. Sounds crazy. I should say it's a terrible thing. Do you know what Yosef calls his first child, born unto Osnat? You know what his first child was called? Menashe. Okay, nice name. I don't know, call him Nashi or something. Nice. But the Torah says why he called him that. Ki nashani elokim et kol amalivi et kol beti. I thank God for letting me forget about my family. That's what Menashe means. Nashani elokim. He helped me forget. Sounds a terrible thing. But if you understand what Yosef was thinking that he's no longer part of the family, then may it all make sense. Because he thought he was now detached from the family. For whatever reason, God's reason, whatever, he wasn't going to go on with the Israelite clan. So he'll do it someplace else, somehow else. I mean, he had a tough time there. He was in, you know, he was a slave, then he was in this, a jail, you know. And he figures that that's the end of it. And that's why. That's what he thinks. Feels awful to say that, doesn't it? I'm sorry, that's what the Torah seems to be telling us. That's what the Torah seems to be telling us, doesn't it? And that's what's happening here. Yeah. And yet when Yosef was in a problem with Potiphar's wife, it was the image of his father and what his father had taught him that made him stop. 
Is that what the Torah says? I don't know. I do, I, I do know. It doesn't say that. So part of Chazal say that very beautifully, and that's the Chazal approach to what happened here. But that's not what it says. I will tell you this. He was a very God-fearing man. You don't have to be from the sons of um, Yaakov to be God-fearing. Understand that term of uh, Yerei Elohim did not only uh, happen and apply to those uh, in the, from uh, before. Uh, Avimelech said, Elohim ani Yerei. I fear Yosef says that a God fearing meant a basically a moral person. Rock and Rock and Elokim Mamakom Hazeh said Abraham before he, oh Yitzchak says before he goes to the uh, police team. They're, they're, they're not God fearing. It meant they weren't a, they weren't really a very moral thing, and they would do they would grab one's wife in order to uh, you know, take them because they're not God. But so. Being God-fearing doesn't necessarily mean he went and put tefillin every morning. It meant he had a concept, concept of what morality is, what the proper thing, that, that all that, that God expected from B'nai Noah, how to, to behave. Yes? Well, then again, he was viceroy of Egypt, wasn't he? Whether he's leading over them, maybe not. He may have said, oops. Ah, but when his brothers came, that's when things begin to change. That's when Yosef, and I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself because we're going to have no time here, but that's what Yosef, exactly what happens. That was a big change in Yosef. His assumption that he was no longer part of the family gets broken down when he sees the family. I, I can imagine that. Oh, my God. And they don't see him. He can no longer l live in that make-believe world of I'm going to make it myself and my family is not my family because they re rejected me, the Gamarno. He sees them, and emotionally, what is he going to do? I, I can't do it this time, but when we come back, I'll continue with this. Because you're going to find what happens when he sees them, what his plan is, and what happens when he realizes that, oops, I was wrong, which is exactly what is going to happen. I'm also going to show where you, I know you're going to grab me and say, hey, it's, that's the Torah, but the Torah says this, I'll tell you what, what the Torah says that seems to undermine um, what I said, but don't worry, I'm not wrong. Okay? The Torah sometimes. No, I'll show you how to understand, because there's one point where it seems that they said, uh, oh, we sold him. Well, uh, actually, Yosef says, you sold me to Egypt. And that's part of what I told you. He thought they did. Yeah. <laughs> 